In our last video, we left off having constructed a keyboard interface for the hack computer with one shift register accepting one scan code and the ability to translate that scan code into its associated ASCII code. So in this video, we're going to add a little more sophistication. Before we do, though, let's talk for a second about make and break and what that is. When you press a key on the keyboard, the make code is the scan code. The break code is F0 followed by the scan code of the key that you pressed. So since this circuit only deals with receiving make codes and doesn't understand the notion of a break code, and of course the notion of a break code means that you shouldn't be sending anything to ASCII out if you receive a break for a key, we need to add some additional uh, state because we need to be able to look at whether or not we receive the FO code. So in order to do that, let's add another shift register. And of course our shift register is going to need the clock. So let's talk about the value that we're going to feed to this shift register. The values that come through here should be the values that are leaving this sh this shift register, right? So this input here to be tied to this output. Now what we need to know here is whether we have a valid scan code or not, just like up here, but with the additional requirement of we need to know whether the scan code is the uh, scan code F0. So let's build a component to do that. And let's call this break validator. So similar to the scan code validator built in the last video, the break validator needs a scan code to operate on. And it needs the clock. And it needs this value, I'm going to call it TOS for top of stack valid. And I'm going to explain what this input's going to do here in a bit. And then on the output, it just needs to know whether we have a break code or not. Now, we, first thing we need to know is do we have a valid scan code in our input? And so we built a scan code validator in the last video to do that. So let's just use that. So for our input to the scan code validator, we need our input value to validate. And then we need the clock. And we're going to wire this top of stack valid input to our reset. And again, it will be more obvious why we're doing this uh, in a bit. So now we know whether or not our scan code is valid, but what we're actually really wanting to know is, do we have the FO value sitting in D? So uh, we need to, you know, we need to extract that scan code from uh, our input. This is 11 bit, but our scan code is actually 8 bit. And again, we had an extractor that was built. So let's just use that. So we can use a comparison now, given that we have a scan code, to determine whether or not we have the FO code. So we'll set that to FO and then wire that up. So now we know when this is equal that we've received FO. So what we need to know is then for break to be true, we need to have a valid scan code and it needs to be equal to FO. So let's do that with an AND gate.
And just like that, we have a brake validator. All right, so let's insert this back into our design. So the input of our brake validator is going to be the scan code value. So let's assemble that. And then let's add the clock. Okay, so top of stack valid, let's talk about this input. There is a scan code validator that is validating this scan code. Inside the brake validator, we also have a scan code validator. And if you'll recall from the last video, these validators have a counter in them to count the number of bits that we've received in the, in the scan code, because if you don't get all the bits, well, computing whether it's valid or not doesn't make any sense anyway. And so what if the counters of these two, and again, could be multiple, uh, in fact, we will be adding multiple of these later on, but what if these counters get out of sync for some reason? So this input is meant to be a way to manually clear the internal counter here, even though they should clear. Once you get valid, then the next on the next tick, the counter is going to get reset anyway. However, this makes certain that the counters amongst a group of these scan codes actually all remain in sync. So what we have to do here is we just simply say uh, top of stack valid. And we just wire that up down here. Okay, so now what do we do when once we get a valid break code? Well, when that happens, we need to not be outputting an ASCII code. When you have a make, obviously you get the scan code of the key that you pressed. When you have a break, well, you, you still get the scan code of the key that you released here. Down here, you get the FO code. So what we want to make sure of is that if we get a break down here, we do not output the translated ASCII code for whatever the scan code is up here. Uh, we don't want that scan code to appear here. We want a zero to appear here. So in order to do that, let's just use another mux keyed on this break signal. So when this break signal is true, we want to send a zero. When it's false, that's sort of the normal condition. Then we want to just send the translated result from the ROM. And with that, I think the break functionality has been added. So let's set up some test data. So here we have our test data. Again, same as last time, except I added the scan code for the break. Let's go ahead and simulate this. Again, it's a little bit tedious, but that's okay. And again, the codes have to go in from least significant bit to most significant bit. So I'm going to put in the make for Z. So it starts off with a zero, actually two zeros. So I'm going to click this twice. And then we have a one followed by a zero followed by two ones followed by four zeros, followed by a one. So this should match this, and it does. And we have uh, the 5A ASCII code for Z mapped to ASCII out. So this is still working from last video as, as we expect. 
So now let's clock in the break. And of course, when the break gets clocked in, it's going to go to zero anyway, because uh, F0 in our ROM currently actually maps to zero. So we expect to see a zero come out of here uh, anyway, and that actually wouldn't have changed without this additional functionality. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to start from this zero right here. So one, two, three, four, five. And now we'll clock in six ones. One, two, three, four, five, six. So we should see this code here, and we do, and this code should have moved down here, and it looks like it did. And as expected, the ASCII out is now showing zero because we're mapped to F0, which is not mapped to any ASCII code. However, this state is not the state of a break code. The break code actually is the Z key followed by the break key. So we need to key, we need to feed in another Z key in order to mimic what a break code being sent from the keyboard actually would look like. So let's do that. So two zeros followed by a one followed by a zero followed by two ones followed by four zeros, followed by a one. And so again, this code should match this code, and it does. And this code should match this code, and it does. Without these changes below, this 5a would have been pumped through and been rendered out on ASCII out. But because the break is now down here, and our break validator is working, you can see this is turned on going through the MUX, our ASCII out is now showing zero, which we expect it to be showing because we actually have a break code uh, as opposed to the make code of the Z key. So this is now working. And uh, the next video, we're going to add a little more sophistication to interpret the shift key. Thanks for watching.